my name is Mark Kui. I'm the uh, farm manager at Scatter Good Friends School in West Branch, Iowa. And uh, we've been lucky enough to receive three grant, uh, SARE grants over the years. And, um, and the first one started, I think, five or six years ago. Um, we decided, uh, talking with some of our neighbors and other hort growers in the area, they were really wondering whether um, cover cropping of green manures could supply enough nitrogen to really feed some of our uh, uh, nitrogen dependent uh, vegetable crops and if, if whether planting green manures could keep up with brown manures, animal products. So um, we're in a nice position where we have access to both uh, livestock product and you know we were really interested in cover cropping so um, I took it to a science class it was our advanced biology class full of a lot of juniors and seniors and they were just happened to be doing a unit on experiment design so they really took the question and ran with it and they came up with a number of different uh, uh, approaches that we could take and and we workshopped them and, and de uh, came up with one which I think is really good that we'll be able to take a look at and um, and in that, uh, we have three different crops. Each of them have different uh, uh, fertility needs from the soil. So we're looking at beets, uh, zucchini, and uh, broccoli. And we do those, uh, they rotate. So we try to stay ahead of diseases and try to keep the soils um, from becoming too depleted. And we have two different plots. One plot receives animal product. We graze our turkeys and sheep there. And we also have a, a manure spreader. So we will spread manure on top. We also cover crop it as well. But the other side receives no intentional um, uh, manure. I mean, it may get some rabbit poop or something like that, but, um, but it's really just cover cropped. And uh, we started with uh, oats and field peas uh, five years ago. And uh, in the first year, there was no difference. And then what we started to see in the second and third year, we started to see quite a bit uh, a difference, uh, primarily in the uh, zucchini. Uh, it seems like they would get attacked by cucumber beetles and wouldn't be able to grow through that, uh, the harm that was done by the beetles very effectively. So um, it became pretty clear to me that we were having some challenges there. So we switched from oats and field peas. And I started using hairy vetch. And it, just one year of hairy vetch, it really seemed to bring the fertility back up. And, uh, and since that time, we've really seen uh, the numbers have been like really close to each other. We've been doing that experiment for, I think we're in our sixth year now. Uh, I collect the data through the summer. Uh, one of our science classes uh, takes it in the fall and then they compare it to past years and they learn some graphing and, and really look at the different numbers and then we can just kind of see how things are, are doing from year to year. So that's been a really fun, great experiment for us and, and we've really enjoyed it. And, uh, and we're still using some of the products. We were able to get um, a little field cultivator which we used to tear up uh, some of our cover crops and uh, uh, some electro netting to put the sheep and the turkeys on there and a nice solar charger. So those things that we're still using and, and uh, and we bring the animals back there every fall when we're done harvesting those products. More recently, we've uh, we received a grant for uh, doing some worm composting. And in the last three or four years, we've been really scaling up on our vermicomposting. We've started with like a lot of people, you know, just in buckets or small Rubbermaid containers. But um, but we've been growing and growing and growing that. And um, and we really see it as a uh, an opportunity for us to. I try to import as little fertility as possible. I want, I, I want us to generate our fertility. I want to sort of create a, a closed uh, loop, fertility loop on our farm. And that's one way that we can really do that. Instead of you know, purchasing in compost or manure from another farm, you know, what can we be doing here? And uh, since we're a school, we generate a lot of paper waste. And um, instead of driving that to the recycling center, if we can just recycle it, you know, compost it on site and have that feed our crops, that would really go a, a long ways towards us uh, Again, maintaining our soil health and and uh, and keeping the fertility up in our, our land. And the biggest challenge in Iowa is like, how do you keep the worms alive through the winter? Um, you know, it gets cold here, and we can't really move the worms indoors very easily because it can get smelly, and there can be you know some some you know liquid runoff from the various containers. So I went to a. Uh, uh, conference, the Moses Conference up in La Crosse, and uh, went to a workshop by John Birnbaum from Michigan State, and he had talked about how they had started had dug some uh, worm pits into the into the ground inside some of their high tunnels. So using the insulative capacity of the soil, and then uh, lining those with cinder blocks, and maybe even putting some blueboard in there. You line the whole thing with uh, landscape fabric so the worms don't, you know, migrate out of your system, but um, but really taking advantage of the. Uh, the insulative capacity of the soil. So again, Sarah has, uh, has funded that experiment for us or that trial, that, that project for us. So we're uh, standing outside the greenhouse now and, and we've started digging uh, pits 
in two of the corners. One of them keeps flooding, which has become a problem, but there's another one that is, uh, that is doing pretty well. So we're going to enlarge that, and hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to keep our worms through, uh, alive through the winter so we can keep generating lots of vermicompost and, and feeding our crops well. Part of the uh, design of that experiment also is to uh, create a, a series of raised beds inside the high tunnel. So we'll be able to fill those with uh, various types of, we'll be able to just uh, move some soil from the inside the high tunnel and, uh, and we'll be able to keep track of some that we will add vermicompost to, others we won't, and see how that affects uh, productivity on those over time. Um, so again, that'll be interesting to see and, and we'll see what happens over the next, you know, three, four, five years with that. Um, another project that was uh, just funded this last spring is uh, looking at pollinator habitat. Um, everybody is really concerned about pollinators now and, and we're no different. Um, they're really important to everything that we do. And, um, and I've always tried to have various cover crops flowering. I planted a lot of buckwheat, keep that going throughout the year. Um, but I also um, was, had encountered some highly erodible land and we were seeing just with heavy rains recently, uh, there was a lot more topsoil movement than I was uh, you know, wanted to see. So I reconfigured the layout of our farm a little bit, uh, tried to take out that out of production, uh, thought we need to put this in some sort of, you know, perennial, uh, what could we do that would also be beneficial to pollinators. So we're looking at a really forb heavy um, uh, prairie reestablishment. Um, so we're getting a mix, I think from uh, Prairie Moon and, um, and we'll be planting that in the fall uh, for years, we've had a number of different colleges coming out and sort of doing um, pollinator surveys at our farm. So we have lots of data about like what has happened before we planted this pollinator habitat. So hopefully schools will keep coming back or we'll be able to take on this challenge of uh, doing these pollinator surveys and look and see if that by adding you know, a good half acre or more of pollinator habitat, will that really help increase their populations? Um, and then we'll have Basically, we'll be uh, incorporating like what the big conventional guys call prairie strips, but we'll be doing it on a much smaller scale on our few six acres. So we'll have, um, you know, prairie strips planted in various parts around uh, the farm, and hopefully that will uh, encourage the pollinators to, to establish here and, and, and do their work for us. So again, thank you, Sarah, for, for all of that.